So um, it was good. It got some good catch up time, good relax time, and and um, feeling good, feeling more confident about where I'm going with that and how to get there. Awesome. How about you, Jonathan? Doing all right. Holding, holding the fort down here. You got any highs and lows? Uh, yeah, highs. Um, felt like the Lord uh, has really been speaking to me. And uh, I'm working a lot, uh, which is which is good. Um, lows, I am uh, maybe working too much. I kind of feel like I need a break here at the... Um, and I have uh, another meeting after this one and then about four hours of work to do. Um, but, uh, and I've got drama. So, mm -hmm. so that I kind of, I really feel the need to, like, I just want to emotionally get away. Um, but, uh, so that's what I'm, my highs and lows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we had a church planning day yesterday from nine to five. Super excited about that. We appointed elders. We didn't get any closer to naming our church, but uh, we've been trying to name our church for three months, and there's only 10 of us in the church. <laughs> we just, we're batting around the name, you know. Uh, but we we identified a lot of strengths and weaknesses, had a very, very great time of prayer and fellowship and uh, worship. And just um, we went around and affirmed the whole church, affirmed each person. And man, it was it was really powerful. It was good. Um, the low is I'm still tired, <laughs> huh. so I'm gonna I'm gonna get some time off here. Pretty, in fact, I I have an iron on iron tonight, and that's all I got planned for today. So, good, Peter. You got a low? I didn't hear any lows. Um, I don't <clears throat> I don't know that I have a have any lows. Um, uh, I, I do have a, it's not really a low, but I, I put it in the category of a prayer request and uh, see also just see if you guys know of anybody. But my son-in-law is a medic in the Air Force uh, Reserves. He's there in San Antonio. He leaves on Wednesday for Doha for four to six months. Mm. It'll be his first deployment. And, uh, so he and my daughter have been married about three years. So this is their first extended separation. And, uh, so praying for, praying for him, obviously, uh, he's not, he's going to be, uh, on a hospital plane. And so he's not going to be like all things being equal. He's not going into a hostile environment. He's taking people who come out of a hostile environment to the hospital mm -hmm. some, somewhere in the middle East or Germany, most likely if they're stable. But, um, you know, praying for him. And then if there's, if you guys know of anybody uh, in uh, Doha that uh, is, you know, making disciples, I'd love to get him hooked up with somebody over there. I just sent Jim McKnight a Facebook message. Do we know anybody in Doha? Okay, cool. Yeah. So, yeah, that's prayer for him. Um, we had a, I guess yesterday was a, we had a low, but, but as we came back from it, it was, uh, I thought it really kind of turned into a blessing. Um, me and our uh, missions pastor, we had about 45 minutes. We went out in the neighborhood and uh, did, some, did some prayer knocking. Uh, we found uh, five people home. Uh, four of them said, no, not interested. And one of them, uh, the fifth one was a lady that already goes to our church is a believer and we actually had a chance to pray for her that her house would sell, but we were coming back and said, you know what, <laughs> man, some days it's about obedience. Uh, it's not about fruit. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we 
we, we made the most of the time and good, but it was like, well, Hey, we didn't, we didn't see, we didn't see what we wanted to see, but, but we did what we were supposed to do. Mm, good. Well, why don't we uh, spend some time praying for one another? Uh, how about if I just go across the top here? I pray for Jonathan. Jonathan, you pray for Peter. Peter, you pray for Kevin. And Kevin, you pray for me. How about that? Good. Father, I thank you for my brother Jonathan. Thanks for the layover that you gave us in the airport last week. What a fantastic time that we got to spend with our friend and uh, our brother. Lord, I do pray that as he is uh, getting plenty of work in, I pray that uh, would be at a pace that uh, is sustainable, but uh, provides the finances that he needs. I thank you for the work that's being done in Hamtramck and uh, many cousins that he's engaging with the gospel. I pray but that those guys would, uh, would respond with uh, complete and total loyalty and obedience to you. Father, I do pray about the drama that he's experiencing and lord i know that it just sucks the life out of you and lord i pray that you would uh, intervene in that and give jonathan uh, a rest in his heart um, lord just rescue him from that emotional storm and lord i just thank you for jonathan i thank you for his friendship and his commitment to you. Father, I thank you for Peter for his uh, faithfulness to obey you and to pursue a movement with the, the people that you have given him. Lord, I ask that you would bless his efforts, Father, that you would bless his time in the Word, that you would uh, bless his influence, that you would give him favor, uh, that uh, the vision that you've placed in his heart would inspire others. I uh, pray to, for his concern for the his uh, son and what's working out there. Lord, I ask that uh, you would touch that situation and uh, bless everyone involved, that your spirit would be working to protect and empower. And uh, I, I ask that you would continue to encourage and uh, bless Peter as he obeys you. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Father, I pray for Kevin, and uh, thank you for the work and his perseverance. Uh, Lord, uh, there in Nebraska, Lord, as he uh, carves out time to invest in the harvest, and as he also carves out time to uh, sharpen his own uh, walk with you and uh, spending time and study, Lord, I pray that that'd be fruitful time and that you would open his eyes to uh, see himself and to see uh, the work around him and that he would lean into you for the strength to pursue that in every way. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, just really want to thank you for Chuck and the opportunities you are giving him to to pass on the, the understanding and the wisdom that you've granted him through his faithfulness and his obedience. And Father, just uh, thank you so much for the great time they had, the uplifting time they had. Uh, in their church yesterday and just encouraging one another and affirming one another and the worshiping you together, Father. Um, that's got to be a great uh, encouragement to him and just a, a blessing to his spirit and soul, Father, um, as, he, as he just operates within that, that close, uh, warm fellowship and just want to thank you for that opportunity and thank you for the the work that he's doing around the world for keeping him safe and for the, the chance he got to, to spend uh, with Jonathan and father just really um, just really uh, thank you for uh, just his example to us and I just pray that you would use him today you would give him the words that that you would uh, that you would speak so that we would be and with all of us fathers that your spirit would anoint this time so we would be able to encourage and sharpen one another and and just uh, help move us towards a deeper understanding of 
of who you are, what you want, and and how you want us to go about um, serving you in in our context. We commit this time to you, in Jesus' name. Mm. And uh, let's continue in prayer and uh, praise God for five things. Uh, Lord, I praise you that you're our bread. You sustain us. Your work is our very food. Lord, I praise you that you're our wine. You cover us with your blood, and now we have your righteousness. Father, I praise you for being our living water. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Praise you for uh, being our salt, Lord, that you flavor that life. And I praise you that you are our light. Lord, you guide and direct mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Lord, I praise you that you are a God of forgiveness that there's nothing that we have done or will do that uh, you have not forgiven us of through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we're, we praise you for that. We praise you for the power of your Holy Spirit that lives within inside of us, that the same power that raised Jesus from the grave lives in us and uh, helps us to live the new life and uh, be about your business. And Lord, we, we praise you that we don't have to do that in our own power. We praise you, Father, for eyes to see the harvest that uh, we we walk through our day and uh, and you show us people and you show us circumstances that you want us to engage. And Lord, I praise you for that, that we're not uh, we're not trying to figure this out on our own, but we have a God who who shows us what's up and, and leads us in that way. We praise you for that. We praise you for answered prayer uh, as we pray each day at 1002. Uh, Lord, we're able to see that you're answering that prayer in our own lives, and you're answering that prayer all around the world. Mm -hmm. and Father, we praise you for that. And Father, we praise you that this world is not our home, uh, that one day uh, a new heaven and a new earth uh, will appear, mm -hmm. and uh, all things will be made new. And Lord, help us to keep our eyes on eternity and uh, not on the, the choppy seas around us. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you for your incredible love for us. Father, that you loved us first and we love you uh, because of it. I thank you for forgiveness and grace that you keep no record of wrongs, mm -hmm. Father, and that you don't treat us as our, our sins deserve. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father, that you sent him to live uh, inside of us and to fill our lives and to lead us and to guide us and to empower us and to connect us to you and to... Uh, um, bear witness to your presence and your work uh, in us and through us. Mm -hmm. Lord, Father, I, think, I thank you that you, you have a purpose for us and that you have a calling for us mm -hmm. and you have work for us to do and that you've um, um, made us useful for your kingdom and it's your desire to use us and, and to glorify yourself mm -hmm. through us. Father, I thank you for the, the promise uh, that a day is coming when every tear will be wiped away and we'll... Uh, mm -hmm. You, uh, in in heaven forever and ever. And I thank you for the eternity of good things that you have planned for us in Jesus' name. Father, I just um, praise you for all those things that have already been mentioned. And I just want to thank you for uh, your commitment to us to not only give us life, but to, to help us become closer uh, to you and more like your son. Mm. And Father, just... Um, Thank you so much for um, the ability to be to be one with you and know you, uh, even though we fail at that miserably. Uh, thank you for just that that unity we can have when we when we are spending time with you and obeying you. And thank you for that peace that comes with that. And um, well, just uh, thank you that you are fulfilling your purpose in us and through us, um, Father. We can't do it without you, and uh, we we do rely on you. And uh, thank you for your your graciousness to come down and 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 uh, come next to us and extend yourself to us, so that we can uh, that we can experience you and have true life. And mm -hmm. Father, thank you for the home that we you're preparing for us, so we can spend eternity with you. 
Yeah, Lord. So we exalt you. We praise you. We honor you and lift your name up. We pray that as we fellowship this morning, that you would be the um, focus of our affection and our attention. And so, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, let's look at our accountability from last time. I'm just going to, for the sake of time, just yes or no. Um, mine was to pray in our church about a prophet and 730. And uh, let's say yes, no, or partial. So partial. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, let's see here. Kevin, I don't have one for you. Uh, did you meet your following goals? Muted. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, I must have a different sheet than you. Uh, I thought I put a sign in there, but... Um, uh, yeah, so I did. I was supposed to um, uh, do, do a list. So I'd say yes on the following goals. Okay. How about your fishing goals? Fishing uh, didn't quite do that. I've been I've been uh, getting less numbers uh, probably for yeah. So haven't done. Probably done close to 10 doors, but haven't been sharing the gospel with seven people. Probably closer to about two people uh, on average for the last couple of weeks. Okay. Two to four. Do I have, let me uh, throw this worksheet in the chat. I hope I have the right um, worksheet. Jonathan would know he's on it like a bonnet. <laughs> Is that the right worksheet from last time? I don't see your name on there, Jonathan. <laughs> no, so this was the meeting right before last because I wasn't, it was the APEST meeting and I wasn't there for it. Ah, uh, so, oh, here they are right here, Kevin. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at the yeah, last meeting. Sorry. My bad. Let me paste that up there. So here's the ones. Start a new church this summer. Okay, it's not summer yet. But I did my seven thirty. Okay. Uh so Jonathan, yours was to pray and make a decision for content of Thursday night church planners and share five days, uh, 30 minute combo. Yep, I did the following, the fishing, the last two weeks I have not hit my goal. I've gotten multiple 30 minute convos, but uh, not five days. All right. Kevin, yours was to create a Google Doc for long-term discipleship, complete your wig take numbers for Denver, and then we already heard about your fishing. Did you do uh, the long-term discipleship and wig take? Yes, uh, I did both those things. Uh, I still got a little work to do on the long-term discipleship topics, but I'm, I've got it all documented and uh, just ready to refine it. All right. Cool. Peter, I don't have you on this list. Did you yeah, complete? I, I wasn't a part of that call. Okay. I wasn't a part of that uh, meeting. So, but I've, I've been, uh, um, I've been pretty active in sharing my faith um, and um, trying to cast vision to pastors in the area for uh, 
reproducing discipleship. So I've had several meetings and uh, a big transition uh, here at the church uh, this past uh, uh, weekend, last weekend, our elders uh, moved one of our staff guys to an executive pastor to see, uh, role and uh, freed me up to uh, spend more time in the harvest and more time uh, engaging uh, pastors in the area. Mm. So uh, our elders are very, uh, uh, you know, very, very excited about uh, the direction that we're going and they want to, they want to turn my uh, apostolic evangelistic uh, burners up. Mm. So I'm very grateful for that and grateful to have a staff guy. That's the perfect guy to step into the XP role as well. So mm. God's mm. providing in a lot of ways. All right. Somebody quote the great commission. Uh, uh, all authority is uh, given to me and heaven on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the father, son, and the Holy spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I'm surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. All right. This morning's vision casting is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to, I'm going to hog it because I think that uh, this is like a pretty significant aha moment for not only us, here in San Antonio, but for the entire network. So there's a big difference between individuals planting churches and churches planting churches. I think when we first started this, we all thought individuals plant churches. You know, everybody in the church plants a church. That ain't working so good. We in the last uh, two or three months, we began to think about critical mass and we began to think about how do we get to the next generation? And one of the things that come out of prayer and fasting and going back to scripture and thinking is that churches plant churches. Now you can have individuals plant churches, but that's extremely hard. And so one of what we're doing as a family is setting a goal in the next year, we're going to plant one or two churches. And that's it in the next 12 months. That is more realistic. And if the church is assisting in that process, they're praying, they're going out in the harvest, they're recruiting people to that church. They're critical mass for that church as it gets off the ground. But that church is going to have much more um, uh, ability to survive. We've, we've evaporated, I think, at this point, thousands of churches around the U.S. So uh, that was disconcerting to me <laughs> just a little bit so just that one tweak of is it individuals planting churches sure they can do that but i think we're going to get much more traction and sustainability if the church plants churches any questions or comments let's keep that short so we can go into the second third but i do want to clarify if there's any uh, questions or you got some comments about that. I got a question about that, Chuck. So, because uh, I haven't had the opportunity to work in from a, a base of a church to plant a church. And so you said uh, that if the church is praying and doing evangelism and in the harvest and recruiting um, so what does that look like? So, so do two people join an effort and start, you know, start a church or, or does the church, the whole church meet together and invite people to that? Cause you don't want to invite them to the primary church. I'm, I'm thinking because mm -hmm. uh, you've got a there, but you want to start another one. So how do you, how do, do, do people team up in groups to do that? What does that look like 
when you when you're starting a church as a church? Yeah, the first thing is the whole church is praying that we give birth to the next church. The second thing is we've identified the church planners, the Paul and Barnabas in church, and we all rally around them in prayer, fasting, and evangelism. So we go out in their neighborhood and we try to find a house of peace for them. And by the way, they need to be very ready, willing, and able to do that or you're spitting in the wind. So, for example, Bud and Denise here in San Antonio, we all have churches, but their church is just beginning. We as a church here in San Antonio want to help Bud and Denise get their church to critical mass, to health, and then reproducing. So we're going to do that as a church. Um, that's much more... Uh, church-like <laughs> uh, to do something like that. Does that make sense? Did that answer no. the question? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah. I think, I think it's really good, uh, a really good idea. I think the, what, based on your experience now over several years, have you quantified critical mass? Mm-hmm. Yeah, six, five to six units. Okay. Um, when you just have two families and one family cancels, you don't no. have church. There's no sustainability in that. I think it's church. It's just not real healthy. When yeah. you have three families, okay, maybe, maybe not. Four, you're getting there. Five, you're there. And when I say a unit, I mean... That's a family with kids, a couple with no kids, or a single person. Yeah. Household. Unit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Once you get five to six units in that church, it's sustainable. It's going to meet almost every week. You yeah. know? But there's yeah. so many cancellations, busyness. If you have four people in the church, the uh, likelihood of that church surviving is slim to none. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And I think I think that's really good because it's it's not you're you're still talking about let's just use five units. You're still talking about five people who five families who have either been reached or they're believers who have been challenged to become disciple makers, mm -hmm. but one church of those five units is stronger than five churches of one unit each. Right. Even if they're getting coaching and mentoring and you're spending all your time with, if you've got five meetings a week with five households a week, mm -hmm. the, the sustainability of that is pretty hard. Um, and, but if you've got, if you're investing yourself in one a group of five, you, you're doing the same investment, but you can invest a lot more people in that. Mm -hmm. And you, you can invest in a lot more people by doing that. And it's a, a, that's a similar strategy to what we're trying to do right now. And, and we want everybody, we're training everybody in there to reach out. We want to multiply from that group, mm -hmm. but we're, what we're bringing people together. So as a new believer comes to faith, then, Say, hey, would you like to meet with me personally, or would you like to be a part of a group that I'm in? Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of feeling them out for, uh, I don't know, but uh, we've got, uh, that's kind of the, what you're talking about is the direction that we're trying to head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's really about discipling them to, into health as the church. Mm -hmm. And then once, you know, they can start a church anytime they want. They can start a church yesterday if they want, but we're finding most people are not doing that. They need discipleship to get there. So yeah. Yeah. we can talk more about this at the end. Um, Good. I'll kick that around. But uh, let's move to the second, third. Uh, Jonathan, unless you had a comment or question, 
question. We didn't give you the opportunity to do that. No, I think uh, your uh, conversation with Peter cleared up uh, most of mine. I might come up with one for later. Okay. All right, here's the link to the module that we're doing. And uh, Jonathan, would you mind uh, just kind of giving us an overview of level one through three that we did last time and uh, talk about that? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, uh, in the, the scope of movement, we can see kind of a, a progression of five levels of leadership emerging. And the first, uh, the first level is a faithful sower, someone who's uh, faithfully and also uh, fruitfully uh, sowing the word of God among, among lost people. So they're sharing the gospel, they're connecting with lost people, they're uh, prepared to baptize and baptizing people. Um, you know, they can, they can uh, do all, all of that uh, stuff and, and get getting into discipleship too. Uh, level two is someone is a, is a church planner. So they're doing level one. Um, but then they're able to, uh, form, uh, disciples into churches. They're able to, uh, uh plan a church and help people identify as church. Um, and, uh, they're, they're able to teach and, uh, perhaps equip others to, to teach too. So level three is someone who's, uh, a church planting multiplier, um, and so they're doing the first two levels, um, but then they're also, uh, the big key is they're releasing people and sending people out to, to plant more churches or in, in the, our discussion that we just talked about, they're, the churches that they are, that they have planted are releasing authority to the, the community to plant uh, more, more churches. So they're more mobile and they're starting to spread themselves out across um, more communities and more disciples good so what we want to do is talk about l4 and l5 today and uh for the l4 we're going to take a look at acts 18 and 19 so uh turn in your bibles there we're just gonna go ahead and read these two chapters and then we're gonna identify what what does this look like from the scriptures in L4 leader? Obviously, we're talking about Paul and his apostolic band at this point. And why don't we uh, just read like 10 verses a piece? And... Uh, Peter, why don't you start us off with Acts 18. Okay. <clears throat> After this, he left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jewish man named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and being of the same occupation, stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. Then Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia. When Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with preaching the message and solemnly testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. And when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook his robe and told them, Your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to the house of a man named uh, Titius Justus, a worshiper of God whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed the Lord along with his whole household. Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. Then the Lord said to Paul in a night vision, <clears throat> Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent, for I am with you and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you because I have many people in this city. And he stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Kevin, go ahead and pick up there. 
but when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. <clears throat> After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Sincre, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he, he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. Jonathan. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and rode to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who, through grace, had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? And, and they said, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years uh, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even faith's cloths or work aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. <clears throat> then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish uh, uh, chief priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them so that they ran out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. Then fear fell upon all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. 
and many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices, while many of those who had practiced magic uh, collected their books and burned them in front of everyone. So they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. In this way, the Lord's message flourished and prevailed. Now, after these events, I'm not muted, am I? No, nope, you're, you're good. good. Okay, good. <laughs> now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way, for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that this business we have, from this business we have our health, wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. There is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. All right. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him, and even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to enter into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another. But the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But then when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours they all cried with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not? Yeah, who is there? Who, do, who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is a temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky. Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro councils let them bring charges against one another." All right, but if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in a lawful assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's events, since there is no real cause for it. And in this connection, we will be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. I'm going to keep going to 26. After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and when he had exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. When he had gone through all the districts and had given them much or exhortation, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months. And when there was a plot formed against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And he was accompanied by Sopater of Berea, and the son of Pyrrhus. <laughs> and by Rasticus and Secundus of, Thessalon of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. But these had gone on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas 
We sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came to them at Troas within five days. There we stayed seven days. All right. That's a big old chunk of scripture, but we had to read that to get to this L4 leader. So an L4 leader is a movement trainer. What are the indicators that you saw in those basically three and some changed chapters that describe Paul as an L4 leader? I think uh, the, the the example that stands out the most, well, there maybe one of the first ones is in chapter 19, where he's going through the inland country and came to Ephesus, and he found some disciples, and he asked them some questions about the Holy Spirit um, and how they were and, and what they were baptized, and so he's kind of educating them, and the fact that their disciples. Um, shows that they were following Jesus and probably had some ministry going on. So uh, he kind of helped them know a little bit more accurately how to impact the world around them. So that's probably, uh, that's one of them for sure. Okay, so he's informing a new stream about the way more accurately. Mm -hmm. All right, anything yeah. else? Well, just his... Uh, his intentionality of leaving one place and going to another. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he was, he stayed on the move. He got something going and then he, he left it in the hands of others and, and went to a new, new place to start something new. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, uh, by this time, it's not just the individual churches that he's planted, right? These churches are starting to multiply. Somebody read um, uh, 1910. Hmm. <clears throat> this went on for two years so that all the inhabitants of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the message about the Lord. Okay, so uh, this is mm, an argument from silence, but we know where the gospel goes, what happens. Churches follow. Yeah. Disciples are made and they gather. And so we probably see uh, Laodicea and Colossae as good examples of what's happening. Um, you know, Epaphras, I think it's Epaphras, is the one that plants Colossae. And from there, Laodicea is planted. So we're starting to see the gospel spread and churches being planted. So now we have Paul coming in and basically consulting with church planting streams that are happening uh, all through Asia and Greece and Macedonia and Achaia. Any other things that you see that would uh, describe uh, Paul as an L4 leader? He trains Aquila and Priscilla, um, and then they, uh, depending on how you look at it, they could jump in these two chapters, they could jump straight to L3 or L4 themselves. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And, and they're training who? Aquila and Priscilla train. Paulus. And where does he go? Uh, he ends up... Uh, well, I guess he was in Ephesus before, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he's speaking boldly and um, encouraging the disciples. Uh, Achaia, he ends up going from Ephesus to Achaia. Okay. So you kind of see um, a sending model here. And so uh, Paul's influencing people that are influencing other networks. And so you really, it's, it's borderline L5, but we want to talk about the L4 first. So Paul is basically uh, influencing several networks 
of disciples and churches. And that's kind of the, uh, the underlying, um, I'm having trouble finding words right now, the underlying description of what an L4 leader does. They, he does not necessarily own these networks. He is not, um, you know, it was Aquila and Priscilla that found Apollos. It, he didn't do that. The other folks did, and they start a new stream. So he's, he may not get credit for Apollos. He may not get credit for all the disciples and churches that are happening in Asia, per se, directly. But he is definitely salting, influencing these networks of disciples and churches. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Chuck, would you say that the fact that he was, and it was near the end of one of the chapters, I don't have the reference, but that he was there were men and leaders from different regions. And, and so the fact that he has a broad smattering of people from different areas would also indicate that he was influencing other networks because they, he couldn't be in all those places at the same time, but, but they were with him. And so it seemed like he had some influence through, through them in their network because they were regional leaders. Yeah. There you go. They joined the apostolic band but what does Paul do with the members of the apostolic band? What's his MO? What does he do with Timothy or Silas? He, uh, he sends them out. Okay. Or, or leaves them behind. Okay. So he's constantly using the guys to influence and uh, strengthen and encourage the churches. So it's 1002 on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jonathan, pray for laborers, brother. Father, I thank you uh, for your incredible compassion for the harvest and that they're like sheep without a shepherd. And we ask uh, you, as Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into the harvest. Father, that you would mobilize apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers who are in the body of Christ, but who have not been sent, Father, who have not heard the call, Father, that you would uh, strike their hearts. And Father, I ask that you would bring people out of the harvest with these giftings to go back in and to change their communities and their relationship in the world uh, by the power of your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 What does an L4 leader need to do? Think L1, L2, L3 first. So they need to do L1 to L3, and then they need to be able to train um, others to do L1 to L3. All right, good. And they need to be able to leave what they're doing to train. Ah, uh, okay. So, all right. Um, when you say training, Jonathan, what does that include? Uh, example. Um, okay. Modeling. Uh, assisting, watching, and leaving. Okay. <laughs> In touch. Yeah. So we're mauling them. All right. Um, is there a difference between training and coaching? This is a trick question. We're just going <clears> to <throat> bat this around. Mm. There is in my brain, but and there might be in the dictionary, but in common usage, I don't know if there is. But coaching, whenever I think coaching uh, versus training, training, I think there is a specific knowledge transfer involved in training, whereas coaching uh, is – uh, through questions, helping the person realize what they themselves need to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Might think of training as uh, the M and the A of mall, 
mm-hmm. and coaching as the WL and the S to mm-hmm. stay in touch. Okay. Yeah. I, I do think we're splitting hairs, but it's worth it. You know, um, there, there are some nuances there that when you get into a coaching mode, um, it's in like Aquila and Priscilla. They're, they're doing a great job, but notice that Paul comes back around and gets back together with them in Ephesus. They probably needed some more training, but they were far, far enough along that Paul's probably just coaching these now. He's coaching guys like Timothy and Titus from afar when he writes first and second Timothy and Titus. So uh, there's some nuances there that it probably would be good for us to look at, especially when you get to L4. So, all right. What, what does an L4 leader need to be? Well, he'd probably have to be a, well, he'd have to be a servant because he's not going to get credit. Okay. He's going to have to be humble and, and it's all about, it's all about uh, serving uh, Jesus and others, basically. All right. You hit the nail on the head. A servant and humble because you're releasing the um, authority, but you're also releasing all the credit, you know, the, you're no longer in the limelight. You're the apostolic dude that shows up once a year and nobody knows you really. Um, so, yeah, good. What does uh, L4 leader need to know? Well, they need to know what they're, what the outcomes are after and how they're going to get people there. Mm-hmm. So what's, what, what's the pattern? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Paul said the feet to the Philippians, you know, take note of those who live according to the pattern that we gave you. Mm-hmm. And, and so there's, he has to know what he, what, what success is, I guess you might say. And how he's going to, how he's going to nurture people in that direction. Awesome. So it's knowing the end state and how to get there is, uh, what is the end state for an L4 leader? Well, he should, I mean, he should have a network where churches are multiplying and healthy um, so he should have a pretty accomplished, maybe not, maybe, maybe not accomplished, but, uh, more information than the guys helping. There's really, you know, the, the bar can be kind of low because if you've got, um, if you've got information that somebody else is, is they're influential, but they're not getting, they're not as productive as they could be. And you've just got a little bit more experience then you can offer things to people early early on even though you may not be totally accomplished and totally have a strong healthy network of churches uh but i think he's got to know how to multiply churches and and have a strong good network does that get close to what you're asking that that would be a good l3 leader what's Mm -hmm. the difference between that and an l4 leader Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh, maybe an L, what an uh, the end state for an L four leader uh, would it would at least be uh, additional L three leaders, mm-hmm. but also uh, I would think an emerging L four leader as well. He's reproducing himself mm. so that as he rises to an L five, there's there are L fours behind him. Okay, good. I like that. 
Yeah, it's not just about multiplying churches. Now it's about multiplying uh, uh, streams of multiplying churches. So um, it's, it's uh, man, I'm having trouble thinking this morning. It's uh, the I, somebody, Jonathan, help me out. What does it mean? <laughs> Uh, well, he, so he's multiplying um, church multipliers, uh, which also means new networks. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, those, those networks are, um, we don't see him at the top with everything coming down from him. We're starting to see... Uh, things happening next to him and a little farther away from him as far as far streams and generations. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, he doesn't own the gen maps. The L3 leaders own gen maps. And what he's seeing is emerging movements in different places. So, good. All right, we're going to briefly touch on the L5. And I'm going to describe the L5 as a Pauline figure. Um, somebody read Romans 15, 22 through 29. But now since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, that also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. So a Pauline figure or an L5 uh, leader is somebody who's starting mo movements in multiple places and they see the gaps and they begin to address them. I need to go to Rome. I need to go to Spain. The Gentiles are hearing this. And so he's, he's looking at a no place left strategy and figuring out where the gaps are and how to fill those gaps with a CPM. So that's a Pauline figure. All right. Questions or comments on the, uh, we're gonna get to the application here, but any questions or comments on the five levels of leadership? You know, I think what it, to me, what it does is it, it, it's not about a position. Mm. Uh, it's about, um, it's about fruitfulness. Mm -hmm. It's about obedience. It's about, um, what we call incarnational leadership. In other words, don't just do what I say, do what I do. Mm. And, uh, and, and those are the best kinds of leaders. And oftentimes we're tempted to say, oh, wow, that guy's done really well in this area of life as a leader. And therefore, let's make him uh, an L5 leader mm. versus, hey, this person started in the kitchen and now he runs the organization. Mm very different level of respect and very different uh, uh, empathy with the people that are uh, coming up 
under his leadership because he's been there. And it's, um, it's not unlike, you know, military rankings. Mm -hmm. Everybody comes in at the same place, you know, Mm -hmm. you're you're a commissioned officer. You start at a certain place. If you're non-commissioned, you start, everybody starts here Mm -hmm. and by, by merit, mostly, um, moves up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or, or by grace. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But it's get ourselves in trouble. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. The thing about the military leadership, um, if you were, uh, I won't go there. I was going to compare the American and British army, but that's going to muddy the water. I agree with most of what you're saying. Cause what I hear you saying, Peter, is this is relational authority versus positional authority. Correct. He has won the hearts at the different levels of the people that he's leading. It's not an appointment where this is a little bit different twist on the military. When you have a battalion commander, it's somebody that was taken from the outside and put over authority. Now, they paid the price. They paid their dues to get there. But relationally, They don't know those people from Adam. In this process, you know the people that are leading you, uh, the people that you are leading. And the people that you're leading know you and have placed themselves up underneath your leadership. They're following you out of uh, loyalty, relationship, respect. And Mm -hmm. so you form this ministry versus being given this ministry. And that's a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you, you will never become a great grandparent uh, without becoming a parent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chuck, would you, would you say there's also room for, for a guy that just has a lot to offer? He's got the experience, he's got the understanding, and God has used him through his faithfulness and obedience. And he may not have a relationship but with the guy, but, but if somebody is hungry enough for help, they, that relationship may not be as important if they just need somebody to help them and they know that somebody has something to offer. Does that make sense? That, is that the room for that too, or is that a substandard uh, or maybe less than ideal uh, situation? No, I see that still as relationship. The person is looking up to them, you know, and they they put themselves up underneath that leader. Right. Uh, it's Hebrews thirteen seven. You know, they they consider the life of the one that's sharing the word of God with them. And then, then Hebrews thirteen seven happens. They submit themselves under their authority, but that's relational. Now, relational could be you see the guy with skill or knowledge or whatever, and you say, "I want to. I want that guy to lead me." That's relational versus positional. Now, hopefully, the love of Christ is being exchanged and we have what you see in first Thessalonians one and two, where Paul is basically parenting the church. He's the father and the mother of the church. And that's the kind of relationship that we're going to see multiply. If it's just exchange of knowledge, then it's going to break down somewhere. So Got it. So it doesn't have to be uh, an organic relationship that is developed, but the relationship is there uh, for, it's not a positional, uh, it's not a positional authority. It's relational and they put themselves under. I think, I I think I just didn't miss, I think I just misunderstood you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So here's the question. So what? What what does this have to do with us? (laughs) 
Well, I think just in my own uh, circle of influence, I think about taking what I, what I have learned up to this point and looking for people who, in, in whom God is stirring a passion for reproducing disciples uh, and, and, and walking into that door and saying, hey, here's, uh, here's what I've learned, and I'm happy to help you learn the same thing and happy to come to your place, happy to bring some folks from my team, and we'd like to help you get started uh, with the idea that God's going to turn your, your church into uh, a training station as well. And so I may, I may have a tendency to be, be bashful or be shy about that, uh, because sometimes I feel like, well, I don't really see enough happening to, to do that. But I, I think that's part of the value of, um, of, of stepping beyond where you are is God uses that process to teach you mm-hmm. and he uses a process to humble you. If you're willing to be, be who you are and, and, and not try to be somebody else, you know, somewhere else. All told the Corinthians, I want you to imitate me. Mm-hmm. Therefore I'm sending you Timothy. It's like, well, wait a minute. I thought you wanted me to imitate you. Well, I do. That's why I'm sending Timothy. Uh, because he knows what I teach everywhere in every church. Mm. So Paul's not going to one place and saying one thing and another place saying something else. He's saying the same thing everywhere. Mm. And so that, that becomes a challenge to, to be, to be real and genuine and authentic and honest and saying, Hey, yeah, this all looks awesome on paper. Now let me tell you what it looks like in the trenches and where, I've seen God's hand and where I've, you know, really messed up and what I've learned from that. Mm. Mm. Okay. Jonathan, Kevin, so what? Well, I think um, when we look at this, we see the progression of movement. Um, And so to some degree, this is going to describe what will naturally happen. Uh, But some of us need help understanding what to do next. Mm. So if you, if we have a guy who's multiplying churches and he's fruitful, uh, we might need to give him a kick in the pants and say, Hey, you think there are these guys over here who are, who are, you know, multiplying churches or want to multiply churches and they could use some help. Do you think you could coach them? Mm -hmm. Uh, or, you know, don't you think it's time for you to, uh, to, uh, you've done a great job. Uh, doesn't look like you need to be here anymore, bro. You think it's time to move on and to, to start something new. Mm. Um, or, you know, you, uh, if we talk about level four and level five and then the level four guy, four guy, um, uh, this is going to help us say, okay, you need to broaden your vision. Uh, you need to look at a bigger piece of geography. You need to start looking at, not about helping your guys where they are, but looking at where are we not and helping people get there. Good. Awesome. Kevin? Well, it's kind of hard to follow that. Uh, pretty complete and exhaustive. Um, I would say, you know, I don't know. I think I, I had the thought that, you know, if we're going to be like Jesus, then we're going to uh, – we're going to want to start movements and if we're going to reach the world, I think we're going to need, we're going to need to be able to have people at all levels so that um, the work can be accomplished. It takes everybody with the focus, uh, you know, like, like you said, reaching the, the gaps, uh, you know, it has, it has, somebody has to get to that level where their understanding is enough where, and they're, they're able to, go beyond um, where God's used them to, to, to meet the, the mission. If we're going to meet the Great Commission, 
we're going to need to operate at all these levels. We're gonna need, there's, need, there's going to need to be people at each level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And since our, our vision, our goal is no place left, it is very appropriate to aspire to these levels of leadership if that's mm -hmm. where God is taking you. But the other side of this coin is it's very appropriate to be an L4 leader to aspire to help the L5 leader in his work. Mm. Or let's go all the way down to L1. You know what, uh, Peter, I love you as my pastor, and I want to see you uh, plant a successful church. So I'm with you, and I'm going to sow seed. I aspire to help you become a successful church planner because that's my role in the body of Christ. And uh, so the aspiration goes both ways if you catch the drift there. It's, if a guy's an L1 leader and, and he'll never be a church planner, that is not just okay. We glorify God in that guy's gifting and his work in the kingdom. And so if his aspiration is to be the best seed sower he can be in order to see churches planted and being, uh, helping uh, L2 be an ex a successful L2 leader, man, all glory to God. That's perfect. Okay. All right. Any last comments before we uh, practice? I have some questions, but I yeah, mm -hmm. things, so I can save them till the end. Yeah, why don't we do Q and A? We'll we'll do our practice and then set some goals and pray, and then we'll continue the discussion if you got time. So let's practice. So uh, describe the L one through five leaders in one minute <clears throat> an l1 leader is someone who's a faithful sower of the gospel uh among his own relational world as well as uh out in the world that he doesn't know looking for a house of peace uh, an l2 leader begins to take those who come to faith and form uh churches out of those leaders an L3 leader then helps those, uh, ch the church that's been formed to begin to multiply itself. So from that one church, uh, there are new churches that are birthed. An L4 leader then begins uh, to train in another location, another stream, another pocket of people uh, to begin what he experienced uh, in L1 through 3 to begin that and nurture that growth in another place. And an L5 leader is one who is helping to think strategically about uh, a geographic area of the world or maybe even the world itself and how uh, L1 through L4 can happen in other places until there's no place left. Awesome. I'll go next. So uh, an L1 leader is somebody that's obedient and sowing the seed faithfully among the lost. And an L2 leader is somebody who's not only doing that, but they're also um, planning churches and are gathering people together. And uh, then the third leader, level three, would be uh, the, ch the church plant or church plant multiplier. So he's not only planting churches, but he's also helping others plant churches. And so it's multiplying out. Uh, the fourth level would be. Uh, it's called the movement trainer. That's somebody that uh, is is able to help others. So he's got enough experience and understanding to pass on to somebody else and help them become effective by uh, multiplying churches in a network. And then the uh, strategy coordinator, level five, um, would be somebody that's able to see the gaps and move out into other people groups and areas to to make sure that nothing is left out. Uh, no place left. Okay, good. 
So level one is somebody who is sowing the seed, able to faithfully spread the gospel, lead people to Christ and start discipling them, baptize them. Level two is somebody who can take those disciples and form them into a church uh, and, and lead people towards church identity and health. A level three leader uh, is somebody who can help that church multiply and is starting to multiply uh, churches and releasing authority to disciples to plant churches and make more disciples. A level four leader is someone who's uh, been multiplying churches, but then is helping other uh, networks multiply churches and is also helping uh, individuals become church multipliers and start their own networks. And then a level five is somebody who's looking at the broader stream of, of networks, influencing over across many networks and looking to push and coach people to reach where uh, that places that haven't been reached yet. Good. Okay. And now one is a seed sower, shares the gospel, begins to disciple people. L2 is a church planner. He can form people into healthy church. L3 is a church planting multiplier. He's not only planted church, but his church is beginning to multiply and planting other churches. L4 leader is one who begins to help networks of church planters um, by coaching, consulting, training these different networks of church plants and streams of church plants. And then an L5 leader is one. He's a Pauline figure. He sees the gaps, whether they be geographical or a population segment, a people group, um, a, a certain strata in the, in the city, like people that work from midnight to 9 o'clock in the morning. He looks for the gaps and begins to coach and train people to fill those gaps starting new church planning movements until there's no place left. All right. I think we got it. Mm -hmm. Good job. All right. Uh, what are our following and fishing goals as a result of this time together? Well, my fishing goal, I'm going to switch to yours, Chuck, and do 7.30. That's stickier. Um, the um, following goals, I don't know. I'm, uh, as far as apply to this lesson. I'm coaching some independent church planters to multiply. Um, some of those people are going to be our, uh, you know, are successful and beyond, I think, grow, are growing beyond my influence. So that's great. But um, that means that I am back to uh, focusing uh, um, the majority of my time on level two and level three here in Hamtramck. Uh, so, which honestly is not as fun. It's more time with lost people mm -hmm. and more time doing harder work in my uh, opinion. So uh, I think, um, uh, I don't know, I think I've been adjusting my time and, and work towards that, but maybe I need to just take some, some time in prayer and study and ask the Lord uh, if I have made that, uh, if there's something more intentional I do need to do to make the adjustment there. I don't know if that makes sense, but... I think what I heard you say is pray and think through the adjustments that you need to make as an L3 leader. Is that right? Yes. I think uh, what I need to do is 
uh, review the four fields manual on the, the skills and the, uh, the next, uh, the movement skills. How do you move from level two to level three? Um, I think I need to review the manual and uh, make sure that what I'm, what I'm doing is on the money, uh, that I'm not, not getting off track a little bit. As I, as I remember uh, reading through uh, the 2015 version uh, that, that had that information uh, in it and detailed a little bit more, I think I need to go back and make sure that I'm spending my time. Now that I have more time, I need to be making sure I'm spending my time on what's proven to be effective in moving somebody from L2 to L3. Uh, so that, that's a piece of it personally for me. And then um, just continuing to pray that uh, that God would would cross my path with the right people that would allow me to start putting my feet in the water in the L4 uh, area. And there's been a few of those have emerged uh, in the last week and a half, uh, three. Um, and, and I'm leaning into that and trying to be a servant to them and basically, hey, here's here's the vision. And if you want some help, uh, then call me because I have time to help you. Mm -hmm. What's your fishing goal here? Uh, my fishing goal is to share the gospel once every day. Okay. Kevin. Muted. Man, sorry about that. So, um, so fishing is easy. Uh, so seven uh, days a week, uh, ten doors a week, and I like the idea of uh, thirty one thirty minute presentation a week. Uh, a little bit higher quality presentation with maybe a relational evangelism. And then um, for the for the following goal, so no, I was, I was still kind of thinking about that, but um, I think uh, praying about um, strategies, and we can talk about this in question and answer too, but uh, maybe, maybe, Asking people to uh, come up to Denver um, and just just kind of really praying that we'd be able to uh, maybe have a, a focused effort in uh, getting a team, you know, by getting a team here, focused effort on getting to critical mass in church. So maybe explore uh, teams coming up here, people that could rally around and pray and fast and lay hands on and get something going here in Denver. I think that's, that's probably a need. So I'll go with that for now. And I think uh, just um, watching this recording and um, looking at the study some more, looking at these verses again and doing some uh, additional study on it is something I'll do. Okay. Kevin, why don't you pray for us, and then we'll go into Q and A. Okay. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, just uh, really thank you for this time. Thank you, Father, for um, the men and women that have that have put the the effort and time into developing these tools, and and. <clears throat> um, willing to serve others in communicating them and serve one another in um, uh, just a willingness to, to sacrifice and travel and share information and, uh, and um, bolster support in, in what you're doing in different parts of the country. Thank you for Chuck and, and uh, just thank you for, um, I just pray you'd really help us um, 
guide us in in where we're at and adjustments we need to make and people uh, place people father labors cast laborers out father so that um, we can be most effective in our context for you we thank you so much for this time we we commit this um, next period of uh, in between the next this and the next session to you and just ask your that you would be glorified that we would be abiding deeply with you and that uh, we would be um, we would be bearing fruit that abides. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Okay. Question time? Yeah. All right. So where do we... Th uh, where would we put Silas on this? Good to think about that. I have a, I have a follow up to that question. But. Silas. Well, certainly, if he's hanging out with Paul, he's the now one. He got left in uh, Thessalonica. You know, he was probably, you know, assisting in that church plant there. So I would give him credit for L2. And then we lose him. It, he really is not talked about very much after the second missionary journey. So my guess is L1, L2, maybe assisting as an L3 assistant. <laughs> what do you think, Peter and Kevin? Yeah, I don't... I don't know that I would add anything to that. I hadn't really, hadn't looked, hadn't really spent a lot of time thinking about Silas. That's probably a good, good thing to think about because there's probably more Silas's than there are Pauls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't uh, really add much or argue with you at all. But I think since he was. Wasn't he to appoint people? So he was probably a local leader, but it could have just been a, a church planner. We don't know for sure that he was a network. You know, we don't know that he was multiplying other churches. Um, but he, I, my, my suspicion is that maybe he, since Paul trusted him to appoint leaders, that maybe he had uh, multiple churches under his influence. So that, that would be the only question I would have is, is whether he was maybe potentially – a church planner multiplier level oh. three. I don't know. Yeah, I'm looking at this and it looks like um, Silas and Timothy come from Macedonia to Paul in Corinth and then we don't hear about Silas again. Mm -hmm. So maybe he stayed in Corinth. Maybe he went back to uh, uh, Berea. I don't know. Oh, I must be thinking about Titus. I got Titus and Silas confused. Uh, well, Titus forsook Paul in the faith, so. Titus what? Titus what? Forsook Paul in the faith. He did? He did. I know. Whole, is there a letter to him? Letter to him? Yeah, there is, and it's really disappointing. If you ever do a study on uh, who forsook Paul in the faith and what that meant, it's very scary. Scary. Yeah. So, so the question about Silas. Silas is specifically called a prophet. So I was kind of, I was kind of, which I, which maybe he became an apostle, but I'm kind of wondering, kind of wondering, um, what, what. Uh, how far someone's going to get if they're not apostolically gifted? Yeah.
Hey, we're getting an echo. Peter, can you mute? And we'll just mute unless we're talking. For some reason, we've picked up an echo. I think uh, this, I, it's troubling with Silas and Titus because <laughs> you see guys like John Mark, you see situations with Paul and Barnabas, but I think maybe one of the things that we can take out of that is, hey, it's, it's not just okay, it's actually exceptional to be any of these levels of leadership. So if you're not a Pauline figure or will never be a Pauline figure in this lifetime, it's, again, it's not just okay. It's let's celebrate that to the nth degree. Because if you're a one talent guy and you turn just one more talent, you've done everything that God expected you to do. So uh, is that what you're driving at, Jonathan? Or is there something else that you're looking for? Uh, that was good. I think... Um... I think I kind of struggle with um, what does diversity look like in movements? And in scripture, uh, number one, what does that diversity look like? Number two, as far as who we get, who actually does this and who shows up to swarm trainings and who ends up being faithful, uh, is there an appropriate diversity there? Um, because there are people who get really caught by this vision and they were like, I want to be multiply the heck out of everything as much as possible. Are every single one of those guys apostolically gifted? Um, because they want to do this. Um, and if they aren't, uh, you know, what is that going to look like uh, for us? That's, uh, that's the, uh, you know, trying to be something that you're not because of peer pressure, you know, and it may be in a positive way. If I understand what you're getting at, let's say we have a shepherd and they don't have an apostolic bone in their body, but they're trying to be an apostle. And so if we, unwittingly put that expectation on them, then we could break them. Is that what you're driving at? Uh, a little bit. Like I've got a guy who's multiplying churches um, and he is a shepherd to the core um, and he knows it and I know it and it's great. Um, but I'm coaching him to grow beyond that. Um, and he wants to see more multiplication. But I don't think he's apostolic. And I, I wonder about myself too. Um, and so I have this compulsion to see as much multiplication as possible. And I don't, it's not really peer pressure. I don't, I don't know that, you know, I, it's, you know, I'm, I've really bitten, bitten by this vision. So, and I, I see a lot of people who are like that. And, uh, is, are we, I'm kind of figuring, trying to figure out like, are we teaching level one and level two or for everybody? And then three, four, and five, if you do that, you are an apostle. Is that what we're looking at here? You, you put the positive spin on it, which I really like because if a person aspires to this and we're not breaking them in the process, I think that's fine. I think uh, we're all commanded to do level one. That's why I put short-term discipleship in there because now it's clear. We're all commanded to share the gospel and make disciples. Level two, I think we're all commanded to be a part of a church but not plant churches. 
And there's some gray area in that because, well, isn't that gathering of disciples a church? I would say yes, but not everybody has the gifting to get that church to healthy church. I, th I think that's a gifting issue. Um, so I draw a line between one and two right there. Now that's just Chuck Wood. Okay. But uh, if people aspire and the vision drives them this way and they can learn how to be more apostolic without the wheels coming off, yeah, man, I say go for it. Uh, I think uh, probably in the last 10 years, I came into my own as an apostolic gifting. The first 20 years, it was pastor teacher for sure. But there was something in me that was driving me towards an apostolic function. And I think that gift was latent, but no one knew what to do with that. No one knew how to coach me or train me in apostolic gifting. So it took a lot longer for that to develop. But uh, yeah, if a guy wants to go for it, I mean, help him as long as we don't break him. Any other things to add to that, Peter, Kevin? Yeah, I, th I think that's really good. I, I think what my experience has been similar to yours that in the last uh, really 18 months, probably, I have found a t some terminology for this pent up frustration that I would put in the apostolic bucket, like, oh, that's who I am. That's, 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 that's what motivates me. That's what I if I have free time in ministry, that's what I think about. Um, I think one of the ways to help people as I'm sitting here listening to all this, uh, one of the ways to help people find their spot might be this whole idea of aspiration. If you laid out the five levels of leadership and ask two questions, after you kind of laid it out, which of these do you aspire to help people become? And which of these do you aspire to be yourself? And so I think a lot of people in the traditional church would say, I, I think a lot of my people would be able to say, I aspire to be a level one leader and help level two leaders succeed. I think probably the vast majority of legacy church attenders would, would fairly easily aspire to that. And I don't know that people aspire to more than that until they hit another level. So when, once you become a level one leader, it's a lot easier to see yourself becoming a level two leader. And most people would not see themselves as a level five leader without some experience. And so I don't know that I would ever have thought of myself as having the potential to be a level five leader. I had a hard enough time believing I could be a level two leader in the traditional sense. Like, okay, I'm going to go plant a church. You know, I want to do that, but is the thing going to just fall apart, you know, or is it going to work? And, you know, by God's grace, you know, nine years, we still have something. So, <laughs> but I think add just, just as a, as a coaching conversation as an iron on iron conversation whatever environment laying those five out and say which of these do you aspire to be and which of these do you aspire to help others become at least starts to give them a context for what they need to be developing in terms of a, a personal skill set 
and to take one of those behavioral skills that Nathan identifies and say, okay, which, which of these are we going to work on this month? Uh, the, these are things that just kind of starting to float around in my mind in, this morning in terms of helping people see where they are and get to where they want to be. Chuck, I would just uh, say that I know uh, you mentioned it happened to you, and I've seen it in my life too, is that as time, and, as time progresses, I, my gifting strengths shift. And, um, and I think maybe, maybe sometimes guys aspire because the Holy Spirit has put that in them because uh, he has a work for them to do that they'll grow into. And uh, so I, I, I like, uh, I like how you, you said that, that um, we should encourage people as long as they're open to it. Um, we should encourage it and see what God does. And we pray that Jesus would motivate everybody to aspire to be an L1 leader. <laughs> that's, that's part of the problem is that they don't realize they're commanded to be an L1 leader. So, um, yeah. So, you know, the vision can drive this. I think this is a vision casting tool. Um, and, you know, from both directions, uh, both to be and to help. Um, it's a fill in the gaps tool, you know, like Jonathan was saying, you know, what, what does this person need in order to be an effective leader at that level? And it's ultimately a strategy to get to no place left. So it's, uh, it's very helpful, but certainly you don't want to whoop this on people during an L1 or L2 training. <laughs> Unless they're a pastor of a, of a church, of a legacy church, and I think you can cast strong vision. Uh, would you like to be an L3 leader? where it's not just your church. It's the kingdom of God advancing to you multiplying churches in your area and around the world. So That's really good. Hey, Chuck, I, I have to leave because I've got to be out in about three minutes. Um, I do have a quick question, and maybe there's not time to answer it, but I'll ask it now anyway. Um, so early on, you know, when you started, you talked about, um, we talked about, what it looks like to plant churches as a church. And um, so for a guy that's like out on their own right now, and, I, and I'm, you know, there's still some people I can partner up with, but don't have a church that's a community that's, that's able to plant a church. We don't have critical mass. What should a guy like me move to somewhere where that is happening or bring somebody in? What, what's a strategy that, that can help out get to critical mass in the, in the context of, Churches planning churches. Yeah, hopefully you didn't hear me laying down an edict <laughs> that churches must plant churches. Individuals do plant churches. You're planting churches. But it's going to be a whole lot easier for you and the church once you get to church to plant the next church as a church. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, but I'm just, just thinking... Uh, you know, the strategy to get that going, you know, should I, you know, uh, so maybe, maybe it's a combination of, of the things, you know, strategy. Here's what I'm telling everybody. Get to church, start a church. Once you have a church, get it healthy. And mm -hmm. as you get it healthy, it doesn't have to be completely healthy to plant the next church. But the healthier that church is, the more likely that church is going to birth another church. Yeah. So get to church yourself. Uh, this is a key mistake that I see happening all around the world. Everybody's helping everybody else start a church. Here in San Antonio, we started a church. In Leander, they started the church. 
You go from that church to the next church. There's a whole lot of consultants out there teaching people to plant churches and they ain't churchy, you know? So uh, I'm, I'm not against that, uh, but I think we're going to get to healthy churches, birthing churches by getting to church. Amen. All I'm right, cool. Kind of strongly, but anyway. No, I, I get it. I, that helps. All right, I've got to get going. Um, I appreciate you guys. Love you. We'll see you next time. All right, love you, Kevin. Bye. 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 Kevin. Have a good one, buddy. All right, you too. See you, Jonathan. See ya, Kevin. You know, one, one of the things that I remember hearing uh, Kumar say on an a audio that I listened to was he only let people teach what they were doing. Mm. <laughs> uh, that might shorten the uh, syllabus a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but that's, you know, what you're doing in your church, then teach other people to do that versus walking around uh, spouting what, what in effect then is theory mm-hmm. because I don't have any stories to tell you. I just have a theory. And uh, so that becomes part of this DNA mm-hmm. of, of leadership development is I'm not moving up the leadership ladder based on uh, theory and my uh, winsomeness to speak. Uh, I'm, I'm basically moving up on the foundation of the, the pace at which God is doing things through me is the pace at which God wants me to move from one level of leadership to the other. And I do think it's valid, uh, a valid point to make to people is that, you know, uh, every level of leadership is uh, valuable in the eyes of God and worthy. And we don't need to measure, uh, we don't need, we need to measure obedience as to where God has put us uh, first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let, why don't you pray for laborers, Peter? And I want to talk about a little bit of balance to that. So. Okay, good. Uh, Father, we pray that you would send forth laborers into the harvest field. Uh, we know that the harvest is plentiful. Uh, every time we're in it, we see that. And so, Lord, uh, would you lead us to uh, good soil? And with that uh, good soil... Uh, be led to good soil and father in your time uh, for for every person under heaven uh, would they hear the gospel uh, from the lips of someone who can point them uh, to the cross of Jesus and to the reign of Jesus uh, in their life uh, in Jesus name we ask all of that in amen, amen. you know uh we need to do a five hour training so we can hit 1002 in all five times. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, we do need to be careful not to go all the way to the extreme with that because people are teaching what they haven't experienced yet. And so, um, there is value in doing swarm training with people that still have it conceptually, but mm-hmm. haven't done it on the ground. Cause a lot of times that's the impetus to get them over that hump. They, they get it, you know? So uh, there's, there's care that needs to be taken on both sides. You don't want, you know, people that are just theorists running around training people they have no practice. On the other hand, we don't want to um, tell a person, unless you got it all figured out and doing it, you can't teach it. So there's some middle ground in that. Um, so, and quite frankly, what missionaries do, a lot of times they parachute in at the L3, L4 leader, and then they're having to backfill all this stuff, you know. 
uh, just because uh, movements happen and they happen rapidly or messy and all of a sudden this guy goes from L1 leader to L3 leader in a matter of months and his hair's on fire and he's not, he had, doesn't have it all figured out. So in a lot of ways, that's what we did too. We certainly do not have this all figured out even today. So, you know, <laughs> so anyways, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point and a great, uh, great balance to it that uh, am I, if nothing else, am I, am I in the batter's box swinging the bat? Right. And so yeah. I can tell you, I can tell you how to hit a curveball, and I can tell you why you miss it too because I've missed more than I've hit. Right. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm in the batter's box and I'm swinging the bat. There you go. Yeah. If you're not doing anything, then that's when I got problems. <laughs> you know, you're just running around teaching the four field manual. Okay. That's, that's a no go right there. So. Yeah, I have a, I have a question, Chuck. That's uh, not on this topic. Okay. Um, you said at the beginning that you were learning some things not to do. I think this was related to swarm training, but I'm not sure. But I'd love to know what uh, you were referring to. Yeah, I think uh, the big thing that I was referring to there is pushing individuals to go plant churches too fast. You know, um, I... I think people, you know, the kind of people that we're finding definitely want to do that, but they need help to do that, and they need time to do that. Um, when Jeff Sundell said, even in India, the goal of the church was plant one or two churches a year, I was like, man, dude, I was thinking, you know, 10 churches a year, you know? He said, no, <laughs> it's just one or two churches a year. And, the, and that I'm, I'm kind of vomiting all the uh, failures and obstacles on Jeff, you know, as we're traveling to Germany. He's like, yeah, bro, churches plant churches. And it's one or two a year. And I was like, oh man, I wish I would have known this, you know? So anyways, I, I think we read the books, we get trained and we don't have a complete understanding. And so our expectations are all amped up. And, uh, when we run into the brick wall, we, we, uh, engage reality in a very potent way. So anyway, yeah. we, Last weekend, we uh, had an elder retreat. We have two elder retreats a year, and uh, we were talking about the implications of uh, growth. If, if what, we, what we're praying to see happen happens and multiplication happens at a 100% at a, a year rate. So, for instance, uh, you know, one becomes two in a year, just what you're talking about. Two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16. Our, our goal this year is to end the year with four uh, healthy groups slash mm -hmm. churches, whatever, whether it's a group or a church, it's, it's engaged in the harvest, it's discipling people. Mm -hmm. And uh, that if we have four at the end of this year, that at the end of 2017, we have eight then and the and the dna in the four is now in the in the other four then we're good it, it's a it's about a dna reproduction more than a group reproduction especially on the front end that that the implications of that in 10 years just from our church is somewhere, if there's five people in a group or 10 people in a group, it's somewhere between 10 and 20,000 people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what we prayed for at the elder retreat is would God let us see in 10 years 
1% of what Ying saw in 10 years, which would be 17,000 baptized believers who are, you know, in the, you know, some way, shape, or form in a church, whether it's a legacy church or a house church network or, you know, whatever, would, would God let us see 1%? <laughs> you know, it sounds, sounds pretty lame, but, but still in our context, yeah. uh, it, would be, it would be crazy. And then God open up opportunities uh, in your timing for us to spread the virus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it really is the, the multiplication piece of it uh, could be pretty powerful. And again, if ever a goal, if the goal is, is one church produces one new church every year, if, if that's what you're, if that's what you're after, if that's what you're aiming at, if that's what you're praying for, that can happen. Mm-hmm. That's not unreasonable. And what's, what's exciting is that in some situations, it won't be one. It'll be two. Yeah, or three or four. Yeah, that there's, yeah. That just, there's, a, there's, there's that component of it that you can't explain, and, and, and the dynamics of it are, are pretty crazy. And mm-hmm. if you multiply every 12 months, you get to 16 in five years. If you multiply every six months, you get to 500 in 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> so it's <laughs> anything in between uh, be pretty awesome. Yeah. That's one of the big lessons that I've learned here in San Antonio is that my math is not God's math. So yeah. things go like this. And what I'm praying is, okay, God, we have a strategy. We have the tools. We have the scriptures, a pattern and scriptures. We've got great trainers. we got experience. But we need one element more than we need all these other elements. We need your Holy Spirit to flip the switch. Because mm-hmm. all these things... Yeah. They'll get us down the road, but they will not get us to 2020 by 2020. God's got to flip that switch. And so I'm going to be a good steward with all this stuff, but I'm going to pray like a mad dog that this happens. You know, I'm, I'm, I have failed so much. I am, I am totally convinced of this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, money good. Well, hey, I appreciate uh, appreciate you guys uh, so much. It's watching your videos, listening to podcasts, everything is just such an inspiration to me and encouragement to me. And just being able to sit in and hear what's going on, it just it lights my fire in a new way. And I'm I'm just very appreciative to both of you guys for just your investment in me and your investment in the kingdom. And, uh, I'm, uh, I'm just looking forward to seeing, seeing what God has in store, what God does. It's mm. very exciting. I agree, brother. I appreciate you too. Praying Thank for you every day. Thank you. I, I've got a bug out. We've got a little deployment uh, party uh, that we're doing today for, uh, for my son-in-law shilling. So All right. I need to, bu- I need to bust out for that. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. You know when you're going to hook up again? Yeah, 